Welcome to another thing. I'm Larry Menti. President Donald Trump says the possibility of a major military conflict with North Korea is real, and that sent tremors around the globe. It's especially worrisome to people in our area with loved ones in the military. So the question is, is this saber rattling real, or is it just posturing? Ellen Kaloje begins our coverage of North Korean fears. Ellen. Thank you, Larry. A new study by the Foreign Relations Council says that Americans' top fears include the rising tensions in Syria and North Korea. And now, after North Korea has recently said that our two countries are on the brink of a nuclear war, those fears now seem justified. North Korea says it will conduct another nuclear test at a time and place of its own choosing. Tonight, Kim Jong-un's provocative message to the world, another missile test, this one short range, and according to two U.S. intelligence officials, another failure. 28,000 troops on the line, and they're right there. And so nobody's safe. We're probably not safe over here. If he gets the long-range missiles, we're not safe either. President Trump says he's worried about our troops in South Korea because with North Korea testing nuclear missiles, it's hard not to worry about our military and our country. I am more worried about the people abroad that are stationed there than the people here. Why? Because they're in the line of fire. I'm from New York, so I'm more scared about where I'm from because Philly's not that big of a city, but like cities like New York, L.A., those are the cities I'm more concerned about. It's definitely concerning. It's definitely a little scary, but... I think we'll be all right. So I think there are some possibilities of U.S. military personnel being uh, sent off to you know, foreign situations. Um, so I understand why Americans have a concern about it. I have a concern about it. Professor David Barrett is an historian who's been teaching political science at Villanova University for 26 years. He says he doesn't want anyone to lose sleep over all these conflicts, but he can't rule out the possibility of America getting embroiled in yet another war. The fearful thing is they do have atomic warheads, number one, there's no doubt about that. Number two, the general process of making progress on missiles is you do these tests, you have failures, you improve things. So it's, it is a fearful, it is a, uh, a problematic situation that we face with North Korea in terms of our security here. So I have some fears about that, to be honest. A North Korean newspaper recently came out and said that its country is waiting for the moment to reduce the U.S. homeland to ruins. And that statement certainly won't alleviate anyone's fears. Reporting for Another Thing, I'm Ellen Koloje. All right, thank you, Ellen. To talk more about North Korea and the threat, and if it's real, is Frank Spano, executive director at the Counterterrorism Institute, and John Comiskey, retired New York police lieutenant and Monmouth University professor. Thank you both so much for coming back. We, we wanted to focus this segment on the concern of U.S. citizens, especially people in our area who have loved ones in the military. We have some bases near here, and of course there's a lot of military families in the area. So let me ask you both, and I'll start with you, Frank, how real is this threat? Uh, the likelihood of an actual armed conflict with North Korea at this point is limited, uh, and if it were to occur, I think we're more likely to see the use of newer high-yield explosive devices, the MOAB, daisy cutters, uh, more airstrike and precision targets than an actual full-scale land attack. And Donald Trump ran as a candidate where he said he kept saying, I'm not going to send troops, I'm not going to send troops, and now he just did an interview saying we're close to a major conflict with North Korea. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm both a nationalist and an internationalist. So you, you have the campaign Donald Trump, and now you have the president uh, Donald Trump, who, who is the commander in chief. I, I mean, Correct. would we go to war with North Korea? Uh, all options are on the table. It's something that the, the president has said, I want to avoid. I right. want to avoid that. But again, all options are on the table. I, I do think that the. Uh, the uh, hellfire attack in, in, in Syria is sending a message, and that is, if you cross a red line, we will take action. Right. And the red line would be sending a missile. It wouldn't even have to be a nuclear missile, right? Just sending Correct. a missile at another country right. that is an ally of ours. That's right. And, and the United States has done a good job of projecting the show of force, our willingness, as John said, our willingness to use force should that line be crossed. It, it seems to me, I've always thought of, of King Jong-un as like the crazy neighbor down the street you ignore. He keeps making threats, you call the cops every once in a while, but for the most part, you can ignore him because the threat's not real. It, it seems like out of nowhere, we're taking the threat more seriously than we've taken it in the past. What changed? 
Well, we have a greater, we have a more heightened awareness of international relations with the new administration. That seems to be the case. Uh, but in addition, he's actually escalated. Uh, I believe that maybe perhaps as a result of his failing health, his paranoia, perhaps as a result of his feeling that he might be overthrown from within, that he needs to step up and show force. There's a theory that he does this to get our attention because we sometimes acquiesce and give him something in return. Is it a bargaining chip? Yes. But I, but I, I go back to what Frank is saying, and that is that he's trying to demonstrate to the North Korean people that he is in charge, he is in command of the country, and he's, and he's not going to be intimidated by the United States. It seems like Donald Trump even though, again, the campaign rhetoric was one way, has been able to uh, form a relationship with the president of China, and it's in their mutual interest to take care of North Korea. China's now involved. Absolutely. China has always been a military superpower, but they've never been an active engagement type force. They're more of a tacit supporter, ideological supporter, monetary or economic supporter. And so I think that's going to be a major key. Uh, of shifting the tide in North Korea is leveraging China's ability to control them from an economic perspective. So if they were to fire a missile, let's say, would we be the first to respond or would China be the first to respond? I'm, I'm, I would imagine this, that, that the Chinese and U.S. officials have discussed this. And, and, and so I can't make policy. I do expect that should that happen, that the U.S. would respond in force. The U.S. would respond in force. Yes. Now, would China, there's no chance that China says, we got this? Well, well, it would be fantastic if it was, but it's, that would be similar to the use of chemical weapons in Syria and Russia not stepping up and taking care of it themselves. Because China, China doesn't want us in there. China no. doesn't want us going after North Korea. It's no. in their national interest to try to keep us at bay. Right. But you, I, I guess what you're saying is keeping us at bay would happen before the action. After the action, all, everything's off the table. Well, I, I believe that, no, that China looks at North Korea as a buffer. There are, there are movements for reunification of North and South Korea. Remember that they were one nation. And should that be the, uh, uh, event, should that be the circumstance, you wouldn't have U.S. forces at the 38th parallel. You'd have them at the Yangtze River and, and the bordering China, and, and China does not want that. So what, what do you think China is doing right now? I know they're talking about sanctions. Is there more going on? I, I say this, there's, there's heightened conversations and to the extent of we're not going to support you in this. This is not going to bode well for you. And we might, we might support some forces inside your government uh, to, uh, for regime change. Mm -hmm. Now that's fascinating because they would probably have more access to those forces inside North Korea than say we would and, and they're important in this whole thing. Absolutely. I mean, China and Iran I mean, have been intelligence black holes for a very, very long time. It's very difficult for U.S. operatives to infiltrate but for a Chinese operative to infiltrate North Korea would be a relatively easy process. Now they tried to test a missile mm -hmm. recently and it it notoriously failed. It, it, everybody heard about it failing. There was a question that was asked at the time uh, to the administration. Did we do that? Did I, we yeah. somehow block that missile launch? And they wouldn't answer. And, I, and, and, and for good reason. Is it a stuck next like, like mm -hmm. a cyber intervention? We don't know. Do we have that capability? I, I think stuck next suggests that we may have that capability. And that'll be our, that'll be our, our secret and we'll, we'll, we'll maintain that. Right. And it's certainly best to let them think that we did, or, yeah, that we, or at least good, we could. Well, it's a good feeling for everybody in this area. It, it, it's a good feeling to know that if there was going to be a launch, we could stop it before it happens. Right. So we do have some intelligence as to what's going on inside that country. Some. You and said it was a black hole. It's not exactly a black hole. Not exactly. I mean, mostly the intelligence that we can collect in North Korea is mostly third party, either defectors, individuals who have left the country, Chinese operatives if and when we interact with them, and then satellite imagery, so overhead. And that's the concern with, nu with North Korea. They're not a silo-based nuclear nation like we are, uh, primarily. We have other launch met methods, but they're mobile. So they use mobile nuclear missile launchers that take about two hours to set up and fire. And so they're very difficult to track, but using satellite imagery, uh, the powers that be have been very successful with that. With internal opposition, with China not happy with them, with the United States now sending an armada off the coast, what do you think the chances are that Kim, Kim Jong-un will be the leader of North Korea in, say, a year? Um, I, I believe that North Korea is a client state of, of China. That's, you know, I, I think I can make a pervasive argument for that. They're not, they, can't, they can't operate unilaterally. Uh, Two-thirds of their trade is with China. Uh, 
Uh, China is the, the preeminent military force in the region. You agree? I'd give him about a 75% chance. Uh, I think that he is, while he is a puppet, he doesn't see himself that way. Uh, and certainly... But that's dangerous for him, isn't it? Extraordinarily. It's, it, it's also very dangerous for the Chinese because he can't be controlled. Uh, and so there is there's a great concern. So they would want to put in somebody they could control. Definitely. But yeah. it would it would require an entire entire regime change in Pyongyang because any of his generals and seconds, et cetera, uh, are very likely to be as radicalized as he is. Uh, but just to end this, you're both in agreement. You don't see an armed conflict with North Korea anytime soon. No. No. Great. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. As always, thank Excellent. you. Thank I appreciate you, you being appreciate here. It. Frank Spano, executive director of the Counterterrorism Institute, and John Comiskey, retired New York City police lieutenant and Monmouth University professor. When we come back, if you're a small business looking to take your business to the next level, you're going to want to stick around. We may have funding for you when another thing continues.